it is the gift of God. You know, salvation is a gift of God, and that is something that I have to remember. It is a faith that I didn't create it myself, you know, not based on my own knowledge. Um, you know, I will trust that God will equip me with a genuine, steady faith if I humble myself to learn His Word. Well, as reading the Bible, I, I encountered many, many struggles. It was um, really bad. And as I reflect, I really think how I struggle over, over a year. It's, um, you know, I try to be a hero. I, I try to, because I want to wake up early, right? But I went to sleep very late like usual. So I sleep late and I try to wake up early. That doesn't work. You know, I, I tried to read Psalms and I thought it's very, you know, the words in Psalms are very easy or very mean, you know, very lofty kind of words. But then I failed. It, I look at how many hundreds of chapters in there. I was like, I'm not very encouraged by that. And then I tried to read Deuteronomy, even Joshua. You know, I started all these books, but I did not continue. I couldn't even go past the first chapter of all the books, because my mind wasn't there. I read it and I don't understand. I don't know what I'm trying to understand. You know, I was everywhere. You know, I want to, but I want to, I wanted to still continue my, you know, my, my, my normal life, you know, watching my Korean dramas and <laughs> finding excuses, you know, just do a lot of other things that, oh, I realized, oh, I don't have time to read the Bible. Okay, you know, time to go to bed. But, and then finally, Pastor Chris said, okay, why don't you read Ephesians? There's only six chapters, okay? <laughs> so I thought, okay, that's easy, six, okay? You know, one, two, three, you know? So that's, I was excited. So I started to read. So I started to read um, in chunks. So four or five verses at a time. You know, I wrote down my questions. I emailed Pastor and he said, okay, too quick. Go verse by verse. And I was, I was, so, I was so discouraged because I, I was looking at that verse, that first, that very first verse, and I was like, what am I going to say from, from one verse, you know? What is there to ponder about? You know, I, I struggle to write. I struggle to write questions. So six chapters, when will I ever complete? You know, I was very, very discouraged. So I did stop to read at some point. I had a two-week holiday in Japan, and I thought that was a good getaway, you know, get away from that guilt, you know? But <laughs> how long can I get away for? So I was upset with myself. I, I must discipline myself, you know, because my goal is to have a relationship with God. If I don't do anything, I'm just waiting for something to happen. Nothing's going to happen. So I prayed. I cannot do nothing. So I prayed. Praying is one part, right? But I have to do my other part, which is I have to sleep early, okay? So I have to, I have to sleep early. So if it, if it means that if, if I need nine hours of sleep in order for me to concentrate and read the next morning, I have to sleep early. I must stop doing what I normally do, giving up my dramas and TV or, and, you know, all the other stuff. So finally, I did manage to sneak in some very early devotions, you know. And, and I, was, I was very, very surprised. I was very, very taken back when, when I started to be able to do you know, div early devotions, not daily, but way more than I did before. So some days I read mid-mornings, you know, after I drop off the kids. As a stay-at-home mom, by mid-mornings, I already have a lot of things in my mind that I need to do, and I just find it quite distracting. So I really do appreciate very, very early morning devotions because I had no distractions. The kids are sleeping, you know. It's just very quiet. Um, it's very still and... It's just very fulfilling, you know, even if it's even if it's just one verse, okay, now that I can say that. <laughs> and and such a refreshing way to begin the day. Uh, it doesn't fulfill me like um, you know, having a nice good meal or a good T V drama. But this is much better. This is his words fills my spirit and my soul and giving me that that boost that I need. Um, before I start today, you know, that boost in my, in my faith. So when I first started on Ephesians 1, I only managed to write three pages. And at chapter 2 and chapter 3, you know, I wrote nearly 50 pages of notes, of um, questions and our interactions between me and Pastor Chris. And of course, numbers doesn't mean anything. But I feel like, I feel that God has been so patient with me. You know, it took me over one year to finally enjoy reading his word, not just reading his word, but I actually enjoy and I look forward to it. It wasn't a, 
it wasn't a homework for me, you know, okay, you know, Pastor Chris might be waiting for me, okay, where's Wendy's email? But it wasn't a homework, it was, it was um, something to look forward to it. Every day, you know, um, I look forward to responses um, from Pastor Chris, and I rejoice when he tells me I have understood something, you know, in the Bible correctly. And I rejoice even more when he helped me to discover something that I, you know, I missed out in that verse. So it's, it's very, very um, exciting and very, very fulfilling. Okay, um, what have I learned in Ephesians so far? So my understanding of salvation has definitely um, deepened. Um, not that I didn't understand salvation when I was baptized. Well, at that time, it was, it was really the taste of God's love and the hearing of the gospel of, the, of Christ. But the first three chapters of Ephesians has revealed a deeper understanding of our calling as Christians and as a church. <clears throat> and I must truly grasp this idea to be able to work worthy in his calling. So Paul wrote in Ephesians 5, uh, 1, 5, that God has given us this salvation through Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So this is very interesting. So this just tells me how much God actually loves us all. You know, is it he he actually wants to save us because it was it was it, it was a good pleasure of of his will. And and that's just um that is just a very, very beautiful truth, you know, to me. Um but then is this a reason good enough to make us work walk worthy in in, in in his calling? Do you know? It's something to really think about. And next Paul mentioned a prayer for the people in chapter um one, seventeen to nineteen. He prayed that God will grant um the uh, the people spirit of wisdom. Revelation of knowledge of God, eyes of understanding enlightened, and to understand the following, the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance, the exceeding greatness of his power. Salvation should change our lives, just like Paul did. And, and I think this prayer is, is really, really much needed, um, you know, if we do call ourselves Christians. We all need this prayer for the wisdom of, uh, for the spirit of wisdom to be given to us. You know, it's such, indeed, this is such an important prayer. And Paul obviously understood this, his salvation very, very well. You know, he was committed, he was so committed to sharing with people, you know, the gospel of Christ and urge the people, quick, you know, you guys have to do something about it, um, to, to have to apply this knowledge of knowing the gospel into their lives. You know, there are Faith was at stake. So he wrote the letter while he was in jail. And he acknowledged himself as a prisoner of the Lord. You know, he had so much courage and no fear of men. And I, do, I don't think I've seen anyone like that. And, and, and that, that kind of courage is not just that, you know, that physical um, courage. I, I, I'm not sure if he actually was strong or anything like that, but... But it was that inner courage to tell him to tell to tell people that to always acknowledge I am a prisoner not of this jail but prisoner of the law and that's why I am able to move on you know and keep going and still continue to write letters I think that's very amazing so I learned in salvation I have also been given an inheritance and this was already in God's plan so God has planned from the beginning that we should have eternal life and to be reconcile with God through Christ. And we have become follow as um, adopted children of God and raised and raise us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And this is found in Ephesians chapter 2, 6. Um, God, God pretty much in this verse, He pretty much, you know, He raised us together. He made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm not sure if, you know, you, you could see how God actually see us um, and also, you know, His own, own Son, that He can actually place us all together. And He doesn't say, okay, you know, just because you are not my son, not my, you know, you know He's going to put you at a different rank. No, He's going to do the same. No difference. And I think that's very beautiful. And, and to me, I'm like, wow, am I 
really worthy? Like, you know? So that's, that's a very amazing truth, you know? And, then, uh, and next, Paul wrote about our calling as a church. And this was something very, very important that I really learned. You know, God has given Jesus to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. And Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, the most important part of his holy temple. So again, God is doing this for himself, okay? Because this gives him pleasure. A church that is built for a dwelling place of God in the spirit so that he can dwell, he can have, a, he wants to dwell in, in our church. He wants, he wants to have a place to dwell in, in our lives, in our church, you know? And, and that's because he wants to do that because it gives him pleasure, you know? And, and this just tells us how much he really, really loves us. And, you know, and he wants to dwell in the church and we together with Christ as the head form the church. So with Paul's explanation, putting all this together, it's just you cannot have a church without Christ. You cannot have a church without people. You cannot have a church without God. All this will come together and this forms a church. You know, this just explains to me my part being in a church, my part you know, coming to church. And what is my part? You know, my faith. Y you know what I mean? So it really makes me more conscious, even just preparing myself before entering church on Sunday and even more at worship, listening to the messages prepared for me. You know, it, it makes me feel like I don't want to miss out something. You know, every bit is important because that is going to help me because God is always there to equip me, getting ready to equip me with something that I need to... Um, well, be part of the church so that it's going to be strong. We're all united. So we are all meant to have very good knowledge of God and the gospel. And He's there to help. He has His Holy Spirit to guide us, to help us. So we're not alone. We're never alone. Only if we have to, or we have to be open, you know, to all the learning. So we are all meant to guard His holy temple with caution. And that means we are meant to keep seeking, keep learning, making sure that we don't lose track of our faith. And most importantly, building a church that is Christ-centered. So always making sure that whatever we do, you know, we are, we are following what Christ did and we are following Him. And we must pursue holiness and unity for His purpose in us and not our own purpose. And if I truly understand my part as a Christian, I should walk worthy of His calling. And Paul mentioned these characters that we should all possess or seek to possess, you know. Um, he, he mentioned um, in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, 1 to 2, he, he mentioned loneliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another. And when I look at all these characters, it reminded me of Jesus. It, it reminded me of how he always denied himself. He's always, um, you know, and he's always gentle. I'm sure he doesn't raise his voice. <laughs> and, um, and he suffered right? And he suffered very much. And he always, always preached about um, love, to love one another. And those are my challenge, uh, challenges as a Christian, as a follower of, of Christ. And this is the prayer that I really need to seek. You know, there's so much more that, I, um, that I've learned in, in, chapter, um, in the three chapters. And, um, and I would love to share um, more with all of you. Um, you know, at the end of it, um, there's so much hidden treasures in the Bible and it's just waiting for us to discover them. Um, so that's all I have for today. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Thank you. That's three months of Bible reading. What three months of Bible reading can do for you? Well done. You keep going like this. I mean this. When I'm away, you could take a class. I'm serious. Would you speak? I take down notes. I, you know, you just, you know that uh, it's not, uh, the, you're, you have, be, you, this is sharing truths. You have surpassed many who have been Christians for a long time. 
a very long time. Why? There's a difference between reading the scriptures and not reading the scriptures. This is just glaring. Okay, but you've got to keep going. I, I, I appreciate what you said. I have assisted you, and I am, and that's where I am. I assist you in your Bible reading. And she has been an example that I have been using to encourage people over in India, people over here, and there is a little Bible reading club going on. I, just to let you know, Wendy, there have been others who have been inspired and have joined in this club and have begun reading. It is, you don't have to be perfect to be an example. You mustn't think that I reach perfection, then I, you start wherever you are. Look what you said, humbly seeking the Lord. I like that. Why do I read? I wrote down why I read. It begins with a motivation. What is your motivation? Motivation, I need to know. And the word you keep saying, I need to know. I really need to know. Good. Let that drive you. Well, here is another why you read. You fear straying. Do you fear straying? I do. Good. That is what, let, let the fear, this fear drive you. I, I don't want to stray. That was one of, one of the things that why, what drove me to want to know too. Because I see so many Christians after a while jaded, tired, sitting back, just strolling into church. That, I was so afraid I'll become like that. Just another artifact in a church. Churches are filled with many artifacts. Some are so still. I don't want to be an artifact. Certainly don't want to be antique. I want to be alive as it should be. I really want to be alive. And it doesn't matter what age you are, how long you've become a Christian. Just to remind you, Wendy was baptized not too long ago. Not too long ago. Okay, uh, it is obviously it is not because of how clever she is, or how uh, you know, how long she's become a Christian. It's just anyone can do this. Anyone. You can be a housewife with two kids with a very very busy life. It doesn't matter who you are. It really doesn't. That is just the proof. That's why Jesus took very ordinary people and turned them to become who they are. It's up to you, whether you are, whether you will give yourself excuses or you would take it on board and say, well, you know what, I am going to take my faith seriously. I need to know. I don't want to stray. I really want a relationship with God that is going to be alive. Okay, what she shared about, this is my calling as a Christian. This is what it is. This is what I need to fulfill. This is the call of the church. It, these are doctrines that, are, that even scholars today still, will they'll speak of it, but not the way Wendy speaks about it. It is so alive. It is so real. It is so wonderful. That's your difference. Okay? You may have a lot to teach our student pastors over in India if you speak like that. People who go to seminary cannot even speak like that. The sense of life that comes from. Okay, but Wendy, you've got to keep going. She presses on. She doesn't give up. Sometimes I wonder why, because... She can get it completely off course, and I will reply, of course. I will correct you. I will, don't, don't underestimate the word assist. Uh, I will assist you towards the truth. This is called helper. Come alongside and help you, uh, guide, uh, correct. And uh, in the first few readings, you must, it will humble you because you will reveal to me how much you do not know. But you must be honest, and, and if you dare to do that, then we will go past that. What is there to be proud about? That's, 
go ahead. This is where I am. Well, let me. Let me really want to know. It, it is not about face. It is not about being ashamed of anything. I, I really, like you say, I really want to know. Okay, so that in itself become a lesson for all of us. Then you begin to read the life of Paul and stand in awe in how come he can do what he does. Look at the life of Christ in him. It's why we study his life. You study his writings, you study, we get the opportunity to study his life from the book of Acts too. Okay, so maybe an encouragement to all. I'll be happy to assist anyone to, uh, who wants to read and you got to need someone. You read on your own. You, Wendy, would you be able to get what you do? You, you read on your own. She tried. She really did. Okay, so look, I'll be happy just waiting for you. I will not force you. I will not, no, I'm not interested in laying any guilt on anyone. If you don't write, I don't reply. I'm not going to push you. I'm not going to send you reminders. I'm not, I still greet you. Uh, I will still be nice to you. Okay, it's fine. It's, don't feel bad any other way. But there you go, just... Try, start somewhere. Okay. She hasn't even finished Ephesians. This is just chapter 4 now. And it's a few months already. That's start. Did you start? It doesn't matter how long you have been a Christian or how, lit, how short of a time frame you've been a Christian. Read the Word of God that it comes alive to you. That's what Jesus said. My words, they are spirit and they are life. That's the difference. There is life, in other words, the construction, it is life-giving. This is why you've experienced what you have. It is life-giving. You read the word, I'm dead. I read, I really understand. What do you learn? Nothing. You really know what you read. Yeah, I read it. Yeah, yeah, I understand everything. That life can tell. Okay, so uh, keep reading. <laughs> Long way to go. Yes. Uh, don't, don't, please don't think, I, I've got to finish the whole Bible. Don't, don't, don't think like that. Just read bit by bit. How does God teach? Precept upon precept, line upon line, bit by bit. I've taken the same principle, precept upon precept, a truth at a time, line by line, one verse at a time. Okay, that's Ephesians. Okay, and I hope you will be able to say, well, I, I want to do the same. Can I? And then you can bring a word of exhortation to others. Just encourage each other. We say these things, certainly not to promote ourselves. Certainly not. But to encourage each other. It is possible. So many people think it is not possible to read the Bible and understand it. It is only for pastors. Uh, Wendy is not a pastor by any means. She is not a Bible scholar by any means. She is not an expositor of the scriptures. She's just an ordinary housewife with two kids. Okay? That's possible. All right? Absolutely possible. May your hearts be encouraged. All right? Well, let's be encouraged to read the scriptures together. We read X25 today, and we see. Uh, this is Paul himself. Okay? And I like this example. See, from chapter 23, now it began with chapter 22, right? That's when he was taken from the temple, dragged down, stand trial in the Sanhedrin council, Stand trial before Felix the governor, and then we now have another governor, Festus. Time frame over two years has passed. Your freedom is taken away from you. How can you stand it? Okay, those of us who are reading 40 Days, 40 Nights by Pastor Charlie, 
Uh, that is just, it just gives you a fresh, well, gives me a fresh appreciation of how strong Jesus really was. You know he is strong. But 40 days, 40 nights in the wilderness, nobody to talk to, harsh climate, harsh condition, you have no comfort of anything. See, a lot of us are not strong because we depend on family, we depend on physical things, we depend on our friends, we depend on the environment to keep us strong, to keep us encouraged, or to keep us going. What if everything, all of that was stripped away? Can you cope? And all you have is the Word of God that you've memorized and God the Father there with you. That's all you have. That's all Jesus had. That was the test. So when Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God that kept him 40 days, 40 nights. He didn't go crazy. He was tested. He was trialed. Remember, no hold. That's the state. God allowed for this. Satan, you can do whatever you want. You can hurl at him physically. You can tempt him. You can do whatever it is. Anyone lesser will crumble and fall apart. Remember, Jesus went as a man. He overcame as a man. To show all you need is the Word of God. It's God Himself. To see you through the toughest, any accusations against you, you don't buckle under pressure. A problem with us is we depend on all those things. So when it is taken away, we fall apart. We literally fall apart. Right? We go through a bit of suffering, we fall apart. Our comforts are taken away from us, we fall apart. Circumstances are bad, we fall apart because we are so dependent on them and not on God, really. Right? You look at Paul, he was truly a careful disciple, follower of Christ. To be able to cope and take what he did. Two years in imprisoned. Two years where you don't know what, you're going to be there indefinitely. Can we take such beating and still remain strong? He wrote Philippians imprisoned. To be able to say, rejoice in the Lord always. It's... Yeah, it's, not, it's not easy. For, for, for many of us, it's almost impossible. All right? We are not persecuted. We are living a life of comfort relatively, and with there's no joy in our hearts. It, you, we gotta, <laughs> what's happening? And here, are, and here is a person who goes through so much the dependence on God, and he could speak of joy in the Lord. There's our difference, and we look at a person who is able to do this. But inspire us. So there are examples in the Scripture. So I'm glad Wendy mentioned that. He says, as I read his writings, I'm, there is none like it. It's amazing. Inspired. Well, that's what I read the Scriptures for too. I get inspiration. I'm inspired. You look around you, oh, maybe no inspiration. Look to the scriptures, you get inspired. There's the inspiration. You are inspired by a person who follows the Lord Jesus Christ like this. Right? And so there he was in chapter 25. Here is a change of governor. And when there is a change of governor, whatever you appeal for is out the window. It's a terrible thing. Right? Over in India, same problem. You can appeal, you can apply, and then suddenly a change of governor. You have to do it all over again. Right? Your, 
your, as if, where are you going with this? Now, that is a problem. Look at this. Felix was succeeded by uh, Portius Festus. Right? And then this guy wanting to do a, the Jews a favor left Paul bound. That is terrible. So when you go, you want to please the Jew just in case. They, they, now that you're no longer in power, you better uh, please them that they will have a good word with, for you. Okay, I left Paul bounded. And that was it. People look after themselves all the time. They don't care. Okay, and so here's a new guy, new governor, chapter 25, verse 1. Now when Festus had come to the province, after three days he went from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Of course, this is the first place you must go, Jerusalem. That's the main, that's capital, that's the city. Caesarea is the, the residence of the governor. So he went there, haven't even unpacked yet. Straight away, must go to Jerusalem. Then the high priest, the chief men of the Jews, informed him against Paul and petitioned him, asking a favor against him that he would summon him to Jerusalem while they lay in ambush along the road to kill him. So here we have another attempt. Very hard to live like this, you know. Half the time, Somebody is going to plot your death. They've not given up, these guys. Okay, obviously they broke their own oath, remember? They made an oath, 40 days. We, we, will, uh, we will not eat. We will not drink until we uh, kill Paul. Two years has passed. You don't eat and drink for maybe 40 days, 40 nights. You're right. But two years... They're still alive. <laughs> that means they broke their oath. They, they, they don't even keep. They just brag. They don't keep. And so there they were. Okay? And so, now, we got to see this. They are very good. New, new politician in town. We go to negotiate with him. Maybe this is going to be different. They try. Felix did not concede. Now, maybe Festus would. Okay? Verse 4, we read, But Festus answered that Paul should be kept in Caesarea, and that he himself was going there shortly. So he may be new, but he's not, uh, not, not silly. He knows how crafty these Jews are. Right? He better get it right. They, they, it could be an ambush on him. Because Paul's Roman... If he does this and lose, he remember Festus answers to Caesar. Okay, let me just 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 settle down. Let me check it out for myself. Uh, what's going on? Okay, and so he did not concede. He says, "If you want, you come to Caesarea, and we will uh, have Paul stand trial there." Okay, just to get get the historical part right. Okay, now. And then he remained in among more than 10 days, he went down to Caesarea. The next day, sitting on the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought. And then we read verse 7, When he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious, okay, so these are serious complaints against Paul. Not just complaint, but serious ones which they could not prove. Now, that's the problem. They made many serious complaints, but none of them are factual. Can't prove it. It's just your word against uh, his, which they couldn't prove. Verse 8, while he understand for himself neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I offended in anything at all? So, very clearly, they, they laid these charges against him. And so Paul says, look, I have not committed anything that is against the law of the Jews. You can check it out for yourself. Nothing that is against the temple. Okay? He's committed no religious crime, nothing against uh, the religion of the Jews. He's Jewish himself. 
and then nothing against Caesar, which would be a civil uh, problem. Okay, so there we have uh, he defends himself. Okay, so verse nine we read, but Festus wanting to do the Jews a favor. Now, what is with the governors and wanting to do the Jews a favor? This is typical politician. They wanting to do. These are people in high places. Right? If I do you a favor, when I'm in trouble, you do me a favor. Okay? I was just saying to, uh, interesting that how, the, how it works out. This is, uh, in, in, when we were in India, there was the people, we had a hall rented to teach at the youth camp. And here is a group of people, they were called the ruling party. And they would come in, and I want this room, I want this room, I want... We have already booked the whole place. And they will just come and, and so the owner of the building said, please, uh, I know you booked the whole place, but please give them a room. We have to give them, do this a favour for them. If not, we will be in trouble. They're the ruling party. If you want to sign anything, you want to do anything, you don't please them. You need to sign and approve anything. They will make your life so difficult. They can come and deliberately block off the road. These are some of the problems that we, in, in, in real time, in real life today. So poor Pastor Mark, he was already so hot. He had the first day, he had the nicest room. He, he ended up with the worst. <laughs> he was sent up to the top and then, Small little room. They, of course, they take the best. I want, first, they wanted the big one. They say, sorry, we you cannot. We need this one for the evening. Okay, then I'll take the chapel, the, the, the second nicest one. Got air con. And so Pastor Mark had to go upstairs. They looked at mine. I saw their face. They looked at mine. I looked at them. Who are they? And I, Titus, who are they? He said, uh, they are just uh, politicians. They looked at mine, ah, small room, walked off. So sometimes to have a, a small room is good. Right? You got to do a favor. You got to do things like this is, this is the world. What has changed? Not much. Right? So this is the background. Here is Paul's life and in the middle of all this. Now, does that bother him? You see, we see a higher hand all the time. How come Paul was able to stand before governors? He was able to stand before people of high places and not feel at all intimidated. Okay, well, let's, let's take a look at his own uh, understanding. And I really appreciate this. Okay, turn with me to 1 Timothy. Right? What keep, what, you, I ask the question, what keeps Paul going? Eventually, Paul would appeal to Caesar. Right? Festus wanted to do a, the Jews a favor, say, why don't you go to Jerusalem? Paul says, No. I appeal to Caesar. Every Roman citizen has the right to appeal to Caesar. And he has used that now. Uh, appealing to Caesar can go both ways, by the way. Right? One, you get a fair trial. You might come out free. The other one, you will be in serious trouble because you appeal to Caesar. And if, you have, if, if it falls true, you could lose your life. And he appeals to Caesar. What drives him? Okay, well, let's turn to 1 Timothy. Okay, and in 1 Timothy, in chapter 1, and I look at how, this is his personal testimony, right? In verse 12, actually begins his testimony, and he says, he writes to Timothy, perhaps, the pastoral epistles were the last few letters Paul wrote. 
Okay, so in Acts, we don't see this. We see the outside. We see Paul as he is, right, able to stand calm and all. But what's inside him? Read his writings and you get an insight of how he feels, what are his thoughts. And these are his thoughts. Verse 12, he says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me or empowered me, given me the strength. That's the whole idea of enable. Because he's counted me faithful. It's in his mind. He's suffering for Jesus, but in his mind, no, I'm not suffering for Jesus. Jesus count me faithful that I would, can suffer for him. What a privilege. He writes in 1 Philippi, uh, Philippians chapter 1 that I may know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. He wants to just be fully identified with Christ. He calls it a fellowship. You see, Jesus suffered for righteousness' sake. He suffered for the sake of the kingdom of God. And I am privileged to walk the same road Jesus walked. The fellowship of his suffering. And so he says, it is the Lord who enabled me. I couldn't do this myself. He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. I was once a blas formerly a blasphemer, persecutor. He's very honest and very candid, an insolent man. I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. In verse 14, And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Right? At this, and he says, This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy, that in me first Christ Jesus might show all long suffering, that Christ in Him, so when people look at Him, they see the long suffering of Christ. That's what He wants. That's what He longs for. As a pattern to those who are going to believe on Him for everlasting life. Now, to him, to the King Eternal. See, this is Paul. To the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. In his mind, I know the King Eternal. Who am I afraid of? You think he's going to be afraid of Festus? He's going to even be afraid of Caesar? In his mind, the reality of God. How real is God in our life? We say we believe in God, but sometimes our response betray us. We say this is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is King Eternal. This is after so many years, and he could still recall the grace and love of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So, Wendy, this is fresh for you. This is exciting for you. Great. But I hope you keep it up. Many years later, you could still speak of the same thing. That was my hope. I remember a time when I had the exact same. I was so excited. Somebody switched on the light bulb. The Word of God came alive. In the moment I wrote, I said, I, I remember writing. And I said, this is such a real joy in my heart. At the same time, fear. I was so scared that I would lose this. It was just for a moment. That's almost 20 years ago. Not lost it. That is, is it possible? Yes. I just, I would really want to know the Lord. I need to know the Lord. Same thing. I, I fear going astray. I want to know His Word. I wanted to do this for myself. Not so I can teach. Not so I can do this and that. Not so I can come up and speak. I do not seek this thing so I can speak or teach. It is for myself. As I ought to. It's my relationship with God. Because, I say, I want to be a faithful follower of Christ. 
And so that was all Paul was seeking to. This is what the Lord, He is faithful. He, you know, I obtained mercy. He enabled me. That's His own testimony. He, no mention of how many churches He planted. No mention of how many people He taught. No mention of how many souls He won. Nah, that's not important. It is Christ that kept Him going. The, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus believed in Him. That's what he meant, with faith and love. That the Lord loved him and believed in him. I believe in you, Paul. Actually, nobody believed in Paul. When, first, when Paul first came into the scene, everybody was scared of him. All of Jerusalem, whoa, what he did, nobody believed in it. How can a person change so fast? Everybody was skeptical. Except Barnabas. You see, once an encourager, always an encourager. This is what I call a son of encouragement. He always gives people the benefit of the doubt. See, anyone can change. This is your, this is your Barnabas. He says, wow, uh, Paul, nobody, well, come, Paul. I, I be, he befriended Paul. And he brought him in. And he tells people, no, no, don't miss He really changed man. I've seen this. In fact, he preaches Christ. And so it was Barnabas who brought Paul in. Nobody believed in Paul. Certainly nobody loved him. Right? Not even Ananias. <laughs> right? The Lord says to Ananias, Ananias, I send you to Paul. He's a chosen vessel of mine. He is going to suffer many things for my name's sake. He's, I don't know whether Ananias was listening. All he said was, Lord, he, he's persecuted many. He's a bad fellow. He's... So the Lord has to tell Anna, you go. I tell you, you just go. Ah, very skeptical. Right? Who believed in Paul? Human being? Well, there was a Barnabas, but most of all, it was not human being that mattered to Paul. Jesus believed in Paul. I believe in you. I've chosen you. Love you, believe in you. That was always in Paul's heart and mind. That's all that is needed for him to, you know, you can hurl whatever accusations against him. You can look down on him. He was faithful to his master, the Lord. He just wanted to know Jesus. This is obvious in Philippians chapter 3. He will count all things lost. What did Wendy lose? Korean drama. <laughs> lose some of this stuff here. Lose, I don't know what else she lost. She only mentioned Korean drama. So there you go. Don't know what else she does in her free time. Right? Okay, but that seems most precious to her because she mentioned it a few times already. But to some people, Korean drama is really, you, it's very hard to depart with. For me, no problem. You don't never began. So that is not a deal for me. I look at it, I don't even understand it. One is in Korean. Second, half the time crying. So it's very hard to understand the things that why you appreciate. But we all lose certain things set aside. I have to count certain things lost that I may gain the excellent knowledge of Christ. You're right. Not, you don't, I cannot let go. I want to continue with my normal life, whatever that is. Your normal life is watching drama, sleep very late, aspire to wake up very early. You know what kind of logic that is. But, right? And, then, and still have a wonderful faith. In, in your world, it works. What did Jesus say? Follow me. One, deny self. Take up your cross and then follow me. We don't know how to deny ourselves. We are too scared to take up the cross. No commitment there. And we want to follow Jesus. How does that work? Paul was a careful follower. He said, I count all things lost. And when you do that, you, like the disciples, they forsook all. They followed the Lord. First, forsaking all. Then the Lord will open up His word to you. 
you will see the Word of God very differently. Okay? And a lot of people cannot. How come I read? I don't understand. How come I cannot believe? How come it doesn't move my heart? How come? What have you forsaken? Nothing. You didn't change your lifestyle. You make all sorts of excuses. You can't come. You cannot. No time to read the Bible because you've got so much commitment. Sure. You also suffer. And then how come God is not speaking to my heart? Well, you've just answered your own question. So obvious. Right? Oh, I'm sorry, our Lord. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so you're sorry. What do you want to do about it? Do something about it. Look at this. Okay, so Paul, look at this life. He, he says this is not, he was the worst of sin. Humbly he came to the Lord. I am the chief, and yet you saved me, you loved me, you believed in me. How could I not be driven to know you, to love you, to follow you, even it is to the path of suffering? He became a man. I was just sharing this with the young people yesterday that Jesus lived with a great sense of destiny. The disciples came to Jesus and said, Master, eat. This is John chapter 4, where the, the, the story of how Jesus reached the Samaritan woman. The disciples didn't understand why Jesus spoke with her. The disciples' concerns were genuine, legitimate, Master, you haven't had lunch yet. You didn't eat yet. Eat. Jesus' reply to them was, I have food that you do not know. They were confused. Who gave you food? So many of us, our concerns is food. Well, I didn't eat something. We don't think of other people. We don't think of the will of God. We don't think of, that is not important. It's food. Jesus lived with a great sense of destiny. And he said, my food is to do the will of God and to finish his work. Right? What a challenge. See, we know all these words, but then our action. Our action. Why oh, I, I didn't. See, here is a meeting. You're meant to be there. Everybody is going. So when they, you know, we had an outing, this is not to embarrass them, so I will not uh, disclose their name. What happened? How come the car is late? Oh, we had, we had to go and get breakfast. You're thinking food. You're not thinking the whole group. What happened? Because they're committee members, I can speak to them and say, look, you've got to be the example. You've got to be the example. Right? It's in the, not sometimes, the, the learning value is on the outside. And you've got to do this, and then you realize, well, that's where I really am. You look at Paul, it is not his own comfort, it is not this that is important. He lived with a great sense of destiny too. To do the will of God. While you're reading Ephesians, Wendy, and those who are reading Ephesians, you will see Paul talk about the will of God, the mystery of his will, again and again and again. What is his will? What is the hope of his calling? The inheritance of all the saints. This is important. That you may know. This is, we need the spirit of wisdom to enlighten that we may live with a great sense of destiny, not the mundane life. There is a higher calling. There really is. We are partakers of the heavenly calling. Hebrews chapter 3. We have a high calling. Paul understood this, and that's what drove him. He lived like that. Nobody told him, you have to, you have to do this. He just wanted to do this for the Lord. That's the high calling that he has. The, it, he calls it, this is the upward call. 
upward, not backward, upward, constantly pursuing upward, higher, every level. He's already surpassed everyone. He is the teacher, not only the, of, he is the teacher of teachers. Why do you still want to know more knowledge when you are a teacher of teachers? You have, nobody can reach you, and you're up there. No, it's not about impressing anyone. It's not about pleasing. This is my calling, upward call. No, we've made it at this level of life. We are happy where we are. are. We're now a mature Christian. I'm happy. That's where we start dying. An upward call, it is not about comparing yourself with anyone else. This is Christ. He's called me. I will pursue this upward constantly all the time. What a way to live life. To me, that's so exciting. No? Really exciting. So if it's so cold, see, life depends on just circumstances. Hey, it's terrible. Yeah. Where India is so hot, here is so cold, what do you want? It's so cold, go India. You would enjoy the heat. Oh, it's too hot. Come back here. It's too cold. It's too... Oh, we are just oh, unhappy all the time. Yeah, you know, when there's an upward call, when there is a destiny, there is none of these things. None of these things are important. While we bear with whatever we need to bear with, but there, is, can, there can still be joy and, and, and hope and strength because there is the Lord who calls up ever upward. Okay, keep going upward, forward, okay, Wendy? Don't stop. Now that you said all you did, and then, oh, you can go backward if you're not careful. Right? Keep pursuing this upward. You keep going. And I mean it. You may be able to take a Sunday school class next year. I'm not kidding you. I don't kid about these things. I really don't. But you must continue. Continue is the word. Okay? Don't continue. Of course, there's no, no, no such future. But continue. That future could be yours. It's not just for you. It's for everyone. Okay, well, let's pray together. Our Father, we pray, and we thank you that it is not us, but you. We are but just earthen vessels, and that power is not from us. That power is from you. The power to know, the power to serve you. And we just have witnessed this in just a few short months, what you can bring and how you can bless the heart of one of our Sunday school students, that we could pray continuously for Wendy that she will keep on growing in her faith and all who will be committed to know your word and to press onward, upward to that glorious calling of yours to be partakers of that heavenly calling in Christ. We pray that our hearts would be inspired to also read your word interactively and keep on learning humbly. We ask for your blessing as we begin a brand new day of worship and fellowship and ministry. May our hearts be refreshed, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, thank you for being here. Thank you, Wendy, for sharing.